Welcome to the China Desk Podcast, presented by the Federal Newswire, with your host, Steve Yates. Welcome to the China Desk Podcast, Episode 11. I'm your host, Steve Yates, Senior Fellow at the America First Policy Institute and Chair of the China Policy Initiative. A reminder to our audience for whom we are most grateful. Viewers can watch the China Desk on YouTube or subscribe to hear all our interviews on Apple, Google, Spotify, and most other podcast providers. You can always access our podcasts at thefederalnewswire.com. My guest today is Channing Movrelis. Channing is Global Financial Integrity's Illicit Trade Director, focusing on the intersection of illicit financial flows, transnational crime, and international trade. Channing has over a decade of experience working on issues related to anti-money laundering and countering terrorism financing. She specializes in conducting data-driven analysis of illicit financial and trade-related illicit financial flows. In addition, she has strong experience providing policy advice and training to U.S. and foreign government officials on illicit trade, in particular, detecting and combating customs fraud and environmental crimes. She has testified before Congress on two occasions, presented to the European Parliament, as well as delivered remarks on illicit trade, customs fraud, and illicit financial flows at events organized by multiple national and international organizations. Channing co-authored the comprehensive 2022 Global Financial Integrity Report, Made in China, China's Role in Transnational Crime and Illicit Financial Flows, a topic of great interest here. Channing, welcome to the China Desk. Let's jump in. Uh, can you help us, Channing, get to know a little bit about you and kind of the arc of your career that brought you to be an expert on such fascinating topics as international financial flows and illicit trade? Uh, it's not something that a lot of kids grow up going to school saying, that's what I want to do. So help us know how you jumped in to this kind of questionable enterprise and become an expert in the subject. Sure. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, I definitely have a very wonky trajectory. Um, I had I got my bachelor's in 2006 from the University of Wisconsin um, in a very random field, and I have not used it whatsoever since. I immediately <laughs> went to teach English in South Korea for a year. Um, when I got back, um, my family's in Vermont. We were living there, and I ended up working at a credit union. Um, so there I kind of came across um, AML, CFT, the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism. And that aspect, as well as kind of the, the you know, detecting and, and combating fraud aspect, I, I really enjoyed and found very, very interesting. I was there for three years. Um, and then I ended up going to volunteer and work in Morocco over two years, um, again, teaching English and studying languages. Um, in 2013, I moved to DC, where I did a uh, graduate certificate in French translation. Um, my second semester at, this was at American University, um, I got an internship at Global Financial Integrity. Um, in 2014, I asked for a job and they fortunately gave me one. So um, I was working there part time. Um, while I I, ended, I started doing my master's degree at American American as well in international relations, and so there I focused on um, kind of transnational organized crime and terrorism, and so I was very much able to marry this kind of pre-existing knowledge of AML CFT um, with the transnational crime and terrorism, and then obviously working at a place like Global Financial Integrity, this is like what we you know live and breathe every day is, is focusing on illicit financial flows everything just kind of culminated into this um and so then once i graduated in 2016 i went full-time at, at gfi so i've been here for about nine years um and over all of this um and particularly this report you know the made in china report it kind of stems from a report i put out in 2017 called transnational crime in the developing world uh where I examined 11 different transnational crimes um, and talked about kind of the values of those, um, the flows, you know, the dynamics, and then the impact on developing countries. And from that, it was just really, really clear that there was a role that China played. And I kind of used China very generally in terms of, you know, you could talk about the CCP, you could talk about the government, you could talk about, you know, Chinese individuals or, um, you know, networks, organized criminal groups, or just kind of China as like a location. 
it was very prevalent in the majority of the, the crime studied. And so that kind of over time got myself and um, John Cassara, the other co-author, thinking about this report. And so we ended up putting this out in 2022. This was something kind of done on the side of my desk over a couple of years. Um, and so, you know, it's it, it, I just found it really, really interesting to understand kind of everything driving both the financial side as well as the criminal side in terms of, you know, economic factors, cultural, social, political factors, all things like that. Excellent. Well, before we get into the subject matter further, uh, maybe share with uh, the audience a little bit about Global Financial Integrity. It might be an organization that's been out there doing amazing things that we have failed to jump into for uh, for some time. But let us lead us into kind of what is kind of the overarching uh, mission of Global Financial Integrity and what's kind of the scope of work that you and your colleagues engage in. Sure. So uh, GFI is a Washington, D.C.-based think tank that focuses on uh, illicit financial flows, um, which we define as uh, funds that are illegally earned, transferred, or utilized that cross an international border or boundary. Um, So this is something we've been looking at since 2006. And in the beginning, this had been very focused on developing countries, and particularly in Africa. Our founding president, Raymond Baker, had spent a lot of time there. Um, And so this issue was, you know, very near and dear to him. And he saw firsthand the impacts of how the movement of cash, the movement of money out of these countries, particularly through international trade and through what we we frequently look at as trade misinvoicing, which is kind of another way to say customs fraud, um, really robbed these countries of much needed uh, domestic resources. These countries are extremely reliant on, um, you know, income and revenues generated from international trade in terms of, if you look at kind of their overall tax por- portfolio. And so when we looked at the money going out of these countries, it was much larger than any kind of official development assistance these, these countries received at all. Um, so we looked at that angle. We've broadened this now. Um, you know, we were very kind of heavily economics focused, very research. Over the last five plus years, we've done a lot more expanding, um, you know, less kind of strict economics um, and more into um, looking at kind of systemic issues that cause this or that can um, things that can be used and abused. Um, mm. So we look at things like beneficial ownership transparency. We look at, obviously, like international trade. Um, We look at things like gatekeeper professions, so lawyers, accountants, real estate agents, those individuals in professions, um, in jobs that, you know, can kind of go either way with their knowledge and skill set in terms to facilitating illicit financial flows. We work still a lot in developing countries. We have projects now in Uganda, Kenya, Ghana, um, Colombia, Belize, we do work in Ecuador, Panama. We work very closely with civil society as as a civil society organization ourselves. I talk about kind of preaching the good word of of AML CFT and and why civil society should care about issues like financial transparency, like corporate transparency, even though they might be working on, you know, environmental issues or human right issues, um, things like that. And so we do a lot of work. We're not to brag. I think we're really effective. We've been really strong with our work in beneficial ownership and working closely with governments to, um, you know, define their beneficial ownership um, definitions, to adopt this, to create central registries, um, and so you know we kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, and it, it's really fun to work in these countries, to work with different civil society uh, organizations, as well as with the governments to help really strengthen kind of everything across the board. That sounds like a pretty fascinating and pretty broad mission. A lot of work to do. Uh, Now, for those of us who've kind of watched from the sidelines at the policy issues related to money laundering and illicit financial flows, most of us would have come to some sense of awareness about this looking at, say, organized crime in the United States and maybe some other familiar areas. Then in the post 9-11 environment, obviously a lot of these same tools were turned into what was 
then talked about as a global war on terrorism and just using a lot of those same financial monitoring and enforcement mechanisms to try to combat a national security issue. Uh, you talked a lot about some of the issues and concerns in the developing world. All of that was relevant, especially in the post 9-11 counterterrorism mission. Uh, and it sounds like your coming of age academically and in terms of a policy practitioner was right around those same times. And I'm just guessing that you didn't imagine that by following sort of the evidence and the work, you would end up with a pretty significant focus on China. Uh, so can you, can you draw us out a little bit on what in your assessment changed over the arc of those things? Were they going on all along uh, or is there a change in China that we began to notice? Uh, but what do you see as kind of the key variables about uh, where we were looking in kind of counterterrorism, anti-corruption generally, and then all of a sudden uh, in the last five to 10 years, uh, there seems to be a preponderance of, it, of evidence saying that the Communist Party of China, the Chinese government, however you want to label it, is a pretty significant concern. Sure. So there's definitely a lot of factors that are kind of at play here, which is, is one of the reasons I find this topic really interesting. Um, part of there was a hearing at, at the end of April that looked at this, at, at China, Chinese money laundering organizations and their role in laundering the proceeds of particularly Mexican cartels, but it, it can be true of, of really kind of any organized criminal group or, or any illicit actor. Um, and, you know, one of the major drivers here is, um, you know, they've always been on the scene. And, and part of this is opening up of their skill set to non um, Chinese communities. Um, the other thing in, and what really has set them apart from other professional money laundering networks or individual, you know, um, kind of individuals or brokers is why they're getting involved in money laundering. So I'll kind of go kind of to the beginning of, of, you know, particularly looking at the U S and, and this issue of particularly with narcotics proceeds, you have the age old issue of you're in Colombia or you're in Mexico, let's stick with Mexico and we've moved cocaine up to the United States. It's sold in U.S. currency. Now, how do I get that, which is in cash in U.S. dollars, back to Mexico, uh, undetected, and then into pesos? And so for a long time, Mexican cartels had done this in-house. So they had you know, their own money launderer. They had their own practices. Um, a lot of times they would move just bulk cash. And that's still a popular method. They would move bulk cash just, you know, drugs are going north, bulk cash is going south. That's why you have, you know, dogs that can sniff out cash. Um, so you have that. But then Mexico in 2010 instituted stricter controls on the acceptance of um, U.S. dollars at Mexican financial institutions. So kind of changed how they did business. So that's one kind of factor or trigger in there. Um, there have always been individuals that have done professional money laundering, um, and frequently this is done through international trade, what's known as trade-based money laundering. Um, I'll, I'll say kind of a little facetiously, this is my favorite type of money laundering because it really combines a lot of different elements, and it, it can be very difficult to detect. Um, you can do something as simple as... Um, just manipulating the customs documentation and saying that, you know, I'm shipping 1,000 iPhones and they're worth $1,000. Um, so you're under declaring that value as it leaves, let's say, the United States. And when it gets to Colombia, you're going to sell them for $1,000 each. And so you're going to keep that profit there. So with, with trade-based money laundering, it's the movement of the value of the goods that's really representing the laundering aspect. So what we saw or what was, you know, a popular method is something called the black market peso exchange, whereby, uh, let's talk about Colombia, for example, you have um, a uh, Colombian cartel in Colombia, they've sold the, the cocaine in the US, they have US dollars, they'll contact what's known as a peso broker, and he will purchase um, those narcotics proceeds for a commission. So he will charge maybe 10, 15 percent. Um, for every dollar um, to take that money and essentially launder that money. Um, with that, he can use it to buy um, 
again, legitimate goods. He could buy um, clothing, he could buy garments, he can buy electronics, he can buy cars. He takes the, the, those, those cash proceeds, he uses it to buy legitimate goods. The goods are then shipped down to Colombia. And when they're sold, um, you know, those, the, those crimes, sorry, the, the proceeds of the crimes are liquidated and they're in pesos. So you've done it in a way that you've never really moved the money, you've moved the value. So you have that, that situation and it's very professionalized. They sign a contract, you know, they have somebody in the US go and collect the cash, they put it together, you know, they, they do a lot of different things here. Um, China comes onto the scene, I can't give you a specific date, but for example, you start seeing it brought up in like Drug Enforcement Administration annual reports, you see mentions of it by the US Treasury, circa 2016. Um, I think when we talk about anything related to illicit trade or money laundering, there's always that caveat of, am I seeing it or am I seeing more of it because there's more activity or am I just better at detecting it? So I'll throw that in there. But they start coming up and seeing um, the presence of Chinese money laundering organizations. And this is in part, you know, speaking with, with DEA contacts, they had used undercover agents who were Colombian to pose as money launderers, to pose as peso brokers, to get a better idea of some of the drug trafficking going on. Um, but nobody was contacting them to launder their money anymore. Mm -hmm. And what they started finding out was they're having Chinese come in and, and basically undercut them because the Chinese nationals that are running these Chinese money laundering organizations, their goal, their first priority in this is to get access to US dollars. So they're making their profit not off of the commission from laundering the money, they're making their profit later. So what they're doing is they can come in and say, you know, we'll charge anywhere from one to 6% to accept these criminal proceeds. Um, there's instances where they won't charge anything because what they're doing later on is China has currency controls. They're very strict currency controls. And so you can only access a certain amount of foreign exchange each year. For individuals, they can only get $50,000 a year. They can move money out of the country. So if you're a Chinese national, if you're in the US, if you're in China, if you're anywhere in the world and you wanna move money out of China in excess of $50,000, you're essentially gonna to have to find an informal um, method of doing so. Um, you're essentially contravening their currency controls. And so what has happened is there's this symbiotic relationship now between Chinese money laundering organizations and the cartels in terms of the cartels have cash, they want to get rid of, they want to launder, launder, and you have Chinese nationals looking for US currency. This still applies in Canada, it applies in, in Europe, you know, really anywhere. So the Chinese money laundering organizations, they're making their money by selling this U.S. currency to Chinese nationals. Um, and so they are just really able to, to beat out the competition in a few different ways. The first is um, they can undercut the rates pretty significantly. I think what also is uh, maybe even more important is they can provide those proceeds to the cartels extremely quickly. Um, previously before, you know, we're talking about the black market peso exchange, they have to go and they have to pur purchase some goods. The goods have to get exported. They have to get down to the source country. They have to get sold. It can take a few weeks, um, to, you know, kind of get that money back in hand. What Chinese money laundering organizations are doing is they're using two informal methods that have been used for hundreds of years in the Chinese diaspora to move money around. So the first is called flying money or Shien, And this is essentially kind of the Chinese version of Hawala. Um, I kind of think of it as a really informal Western Union where money is not moving around. You have, you know, professional individuals. This is their profession or part of, you know, this is part of their role. Um, you have somebody, let's say in China, somebody in the US. And the idea is they're sending money back and forth for, for other individuals. And as they send one transaction and then another individual sends one transaction, they don't have to send the money. So if I'm in China and I want to send money to the U.S., I'm going to go to the China broker, the broker in China. I'm going to give him $5,000 and say, somebody in the U.S., I want to send them the money. They're going to call up their person in the U.S. 
they're going to tell them somebody's going to come in. They're going to give you a passcode. You're going to give them $5,000. What's expected is at some point, somebody in the U S is going to come into the U S agent and say, Hey, I want to send five, 10,000, whatever dollars to, um, to China. The Chinese agent calls up his friend in China, says, give five, $10,000 to somebody there. And these transactions kind of balance each other out. Again, the money's not moving anywhere. So this is why it can be really hard to detect because we're not touching the financial system at all. So you have this, you know, officially it's called an informal value transfer service. The other aspect is Chinese underground banking. Again, it's a very informal service and you can use something called mirror exchange or exchange transactions where, you know, essentially you in one location provide a sum of money and at the same location, you know, or sorry, another location you provide the same amount of money. So what was happening here is the Chinese money brokers are accepting the cash proceeds from, um, from the cartels. And then they would go on to WeChat, they would go on to, um, you know, a, a online encrypted platform and essentially just post it like on Craigslist and say, I have, you know, US cash, who wants it? You know, this is this is the fee for the cash. Somebody would accept it and they co would come and meet with each other. Um, and so the Chinese national would either, sorry, the Chinese money laundering organization would either provide cash to the Chinese national or make it available to them if they weren't in person or sometimes they, they will even provide um, cashier's checks. What the Chinese national does in, in return then is they conduct this mirror transaction where in their Chinese bank account, they'll say, you know, if they've bought $100,000 worth of US currency, they will make the equivalent in Chinese renminbi available in their Chinese bank account, and they'll send it over to the Chinese money laundering organization's Chinese bank account at the same time. So again, not touching the US financial system, we're just touching you know, the Chinese financial system there. It's only moving domestically between two banks. Um, and so by doing so, they're moving that money kind of instantaneously. They're also pro able to do the same with the cartels. So they accept the cash from the cartels and they can immediately then make an equivalent amount of pesos available in Mexico for the cartels. By doing so in such a quick fashion, it kind of guarantees to the cartels, this isn't a law enforcement officer because they just aren't able to move that quickly. And the Chinese laundering, money laundering organizations were also guaranteeing that if anything happens to the cash, we'll replace it. So it's a business model that's really hard to beat. Um, so they came onto the scene and they've just been, you know, really, really popular. You see Colombian cartels looking towards them. Um, you know, it's a service-based business. So they've kind of opened their community in terms of these tools or these, these practices and made them available. So they've opened their networks to, to individuals basically. Yeah. Well, you, you've been a great help in getting what an outsider might need by way of understanding of how this whole kind of network of activity works. It sure sounds like a different kind of threat uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to the nature of detecting and combating money laundering. Uh, what, in what ways do you think that this combination of the cartels and the, it's like two old systems coming together of the cartels and what they're doing and the informal banking network of China coming together and doing what they're doing. What elements of this are truly new from how they do it to the means by which they do it? What are the, what are the kind of new tools, new methods? I think it's, you're kind of existing, you're, you're using existing tools, but you just have access to new tools is how it is. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of these informal tr value transfer system um, networks are culturally based. So a lot of different societies have them. Like I mentioned before, when we talk about Hawala, we're talking about the Middle East. We're talking about Afghanistan. You can talk about Hundi, which is there's kind of to the India uh, Indian area, sub subcontinent. And then you have Faixian. You know, if you're in India, you're not going to go to a Chinese money laundering, you know, or Chinese money broker um, or a Faixian broker to, to conduct these transactions. These are insular um, tools that are used by the community itself. 
So the Chinese money laundering organizations have now provided access to these tools. This is kind of what's new. The speed is also um, what's new as well. They're able, they being the, the cartels or any kind of criminal organization, are able to get their proceeds back much quicker. There's a much lower um, chance of losing um, value or, or of money getting seized. Um, your cost of doing business is, is much better. Um, so, you know, they've really made it easier for cartels, for narcotics trafficking organizations, for, for other criminal organizations to do business better. Um, and so that's what kind of we're seeing. It's, it's the marrying of kind of old and new cultures. Um, but, you know, when you think about a business, if you're able to get your capital back quicker, if you're able to reduce your rates that you're, you're being charged, um, it's better for business. Uh, overall, right. doesn't matter what product or service you're providing. Well, before we get into what do we do about it, there's one last part of this that I that I'd like to understand a little bit better, uh, and it sort of hints at where I'd like to go on uh, what do we do about this. But the electronic communication uh, platforms seem to be an interesting added wrinkle. Uh, there hasn't always been a WeChat. Uh, and so there is this traditional informal Chinese banking system, uh, but you have these communication platforms that allow for speed. Uh, you have the Chinese language as its own form of encryption in some cases, since a very, very small proportion of Americans or others around the world actually become proficient in reading Chinese. Uh, so even if they were on WeChat, being able to understand it in real time would be another challenge. Uh, so when you look at uh, the, the use of WeChat, when you just think of it from a Chinese point of view, it's intensely censored when it comes to political issues that are a challenge to the regime. And yet this informal economy seems to be making very convenient and extensive use of it which would seem to imply that the government of China and the party itself must know. Uh, and so am I, am I right that this use of an electronic communications platform is a little bit different, uh, adding into these traditional systems, whether it's East or West, and then also nudging into who, who really knows and what are they doing about it? The government of China surely must know that people are doing this on their communications platform. Absolutely. I think this really kind of goes towards the authoritarian nature of the Chinese state um, and definitely the, the kind of the surveillance state that the, the CCP runs there. As I mean, you've pointed out, they can swiftly and, you know, very effectively shut down what they don't want, be it um, anything kind of against the CCP. Um, I'll go and point towards wet markets with COVID. They shut those right. down with the quickness. Um, after a long time, they went after ivory. Um, they were very good at shutting down opium production in, in China. Um, so if there's a particular commodity or product or activity that's occurring that they don't like, they can act much more um, efficiently, I should say, than let's say um, a democratic country, <laughs> um, and probably with uh, a bit more force. Um, so that does, as, as your point is, they have a certain idea of what's going on. Um, you know, I'm sure there's some limitations to how much they're able to effectively, you know, see what's happening in terms of every single transaction or, or the posting of what's going on. Um, but I, I 100% believe that there can be more, there can be more done by the Chinese government in terms of monitoring these platforms. You know, this would be very difficult in the U.S. in terms of the encryption. Let's talk about like WhatsApp, the encryption involved. I know that's really frustrated a lot of law enforcement. The encryption involved, the amount of data privacy, you know, all of that involved there makes it very difficult. And coming from a democratic country and nation, they're not going to start getting into that. That's protected. And so, you know, in some ways, China has an advantage there. It comes at a certain price um, that, you know, democratic countries don't don't want to pay. Um, but I think you make good points in terms of these platforms, again, have facilitated 
um, these transactions in order to being able to reach a broader audience. You again, you've kind of you've raised the the barrier to entry for law enforcement, let's say, to getting access to the in, in this information. Um, in terms of the Chinese language, in terms of you know the, any kind of encryption, um, I think you know something else to keep in mind is some of these these systems, either the Chinese underground banking or the flying money. These are systems that are also used by China's ruling class, China's elite, those in power. So there's a certain extent they do crack down internally on undergrounding banking. So you'll see, you know, you can look every year, there's usually some report on, you know, China, you know, cracks down on what's called CUBS, Chinese, Chinese underground banking system. You know, they'll seize tens of billions of dollars. It's a significant movement of, of funds. It's probably those, that money that they want to be capturing themselves. They're not going to completely shut down these systems. One, it'd be hard because they're informal. Um, but they're likely benefiting it from, you know, from these systems as well in terms of sending the money out of the country. Um, you also, these are, are very commonly used, and I, I don't want to give these systems a reputation for being illegal or only facilitating illegal transactions. Flying money like Hawala, like any kind of other remittance, you know, system is very common for sending home remittances uh, of the Chinese diaspora to China, to the to the mainland. So these do serve a legitimate purpose. Just because something's informal doesn't mean it's illegal, but it has the potential to be abused. So th I don't see them ever shutting these systems down for you know the reasons I've mentioned. You know the people that are moving money out of the country as well. You definitely have your elite that are secreting away maybe money they've stolen, um, corruption proceeds. Um, you know, criminal proceeds, things like that. Um, but you also have individuals that the source of their funds is completely legitimate. You know, they're an average Joe working in China. They've saved up funds. Their family has moved to the U.S. and they want to purchase a home in the U.S. Or their child's going to school at university, you know, in which costs an arm and a leg. So there's legitimate reasons, you know, number one, for the source of the funds, as well as why they would want to transfer the funds out of the country. It's just the method being used is essentially illegal because it's contravening China's laws. So we would consider this an illicit financial flow. So let's pivot a bit into what enforcement options there, there really are. I mean, this is a, a really daunting challenge given the complexity and the involvement of multiple jurisdictions and things like that. Uh, how can law enforcement agencies effectively investigate and prosecute these transnational money laundering crimes with all that complexity? Uh, and I'll just flag for the audience, you, you testified not that long ago before Congress about some policy recommendations about what the U.S. and allies should do. But to talk a little bit about how do, how do we get into uh, actually detecting and prosecuting, uh, given all this, all this uh, very complex mix of actors and systems. For sure. I think definitely um, throwing money at the problem can help. I'll say that um, in terms of particularly looking at the different law enforcement agencies like the DEA um, that are investigating um, so sending money to, you know, appropriating funds to the DEA, to FinCEN, to any other law enforcement agency. FinCEN's not law enforcement, but they, they obviously play a, law, a, a large role in terms of AML CFT for, our, for, for the U.S. But providing with the funds so that they can, number one, better understand um, just kind of the 101 of, of, of how these money laundering organizations work. Um, you know, being able to better conduct surveillance, better conduct investigations, being able to hire individuals, like you said, that can speak Chinese. Um, you know, there was a DEA agent lamenting that, you know, previously we could use kind of any Spanish speaking person. Now we have to have a Chinese speaker. They have to be involved in this, this transaction. So it narrows down uh, the pool of, of potential individuals. So building up um, their strengths in order to better understand and then better combat this. It can be difficult, um, you know, as I've outlined before, in terms of maybe policy side of things, because 
most of this is not touching the U.S. financial system. At some point, that cash is. And so that's where there's some chance of detecting this. Um, but a lot of times, you know, when we're, we're looking at how law enforcement is seeing it, they're seeing it at the cash drop-offs or pickups. Um, it's not because the money has come to a bank and the bank has filed a suspicious transaction report um, or a currency transaction report. Um, and so that's a, it's a huge challenge because, I, you know, I'll just kind of leave it at, you know, the majority of the, the global AML CFT, CFT framework is focused on financial institutions. Um, so, you know, yeah, they, they know the red flags to look for suspicious deposits if they're trying to, you know, deposit less than currency reporting, you know, thresholds if they're trying to structure things. Um, but when we talk about other types of money laundering, particularly trade-based money laundering, the global framework isn't really set up to combat this. Um, and so that's why it's, I find it so interesting and, and why it's been very popular in terms of, of being an effective way of, of laundering money. So also trying to better engage, I think, you know, with the law enforcement as well as policymakers with the private sector of potentially those companies that, you know, hey, if I sell t-shirts from LA and somebody comes to me and wants to buy $50,000, $100,000 worth of t-shirts in cash, um, that's a red flag. And also, if I'm a financial institution banking this particular business client and they show up with this cash proceeds and say, oh yeah, we sold some t-shirts, again, another red flag. That's not how most people do business. So I think there's a lot of different ways of, of attacking this in terms of both the law enforcement side, but as well as a policy side, financial side, um, it's always going to take resources. Um, but I think definitely trying to focus particularly on this right now, um, this should be one of the top priorities. We sort of answered a, a follow-up question I had, which was, you know, when people are engaging in business in some, in some ways, it's hard to know who you're dealing with. And even though you might have best practices and want to, you know, keep things on the up and up, you know, what are the key indicators of a legitimate business might be involved in this kind of activity? Uh, you know, the, the, the example of all of a sudden they're buying way more t-shirts than makes, uh, makes any sense. Are there any other kinds of red flags that people who are trying to engage in legit business and doing trade with what seem to be good people would want to watch out for? Because it sure sounds like this is the equivalent from an intelligence uh, community point of view of really needing to rely a lot more on human intelligence mm -hmm. rather than on electronic intelligence, which is what we can have computers and mass capabilities be able to do. But the human intelligence part is expensive. It's clunky. It's, it's a lot harder harder. Uh, it sounds like we're really in that mode trying to get at this new threat of the merger of the, the Chinese uh, money laundering mechanism the, and what the Chinese Communist Party seems to be supporting, merged with the cartels. Uh, so unpacking my overly compact, complex <laughs> question, let's start with what other red flags are there that uh, someone might be engaging in this questionable kind of business activity? For sure. I think another very large, you know, red flag that that's just flapping out there is, you know, let's say I'm selling t-shirts. Steve, you come to me, you want to buy t-shirts. It's the first time you're a customer or maybe another time, but I'm buying them and sending them to you, but I'm receiving a party or seeming, see, receiving a payment from a third party or multiple third parties are sending me payments. That's an, another red flag. I mean, you just kind of think of traditional business when we're talking about large amounts of money. In a two-party transaction, it's probably going to be a bank's transfer. Maybe it's a check. Um, maybe it's a wire transfer. And it's going to be between me and you. When you start seeing cash involved, obviously there's cash-intensive businesses. Um, but I think a lot of times we're familiar with those and, and you know where they are and, and obviously the risks posed by them. But if you are producing T-shirts, if you're producing toys, if you are an electronics wholesaler, you're typically not getting paid in cash by your legitimate clients. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, if I'm doing business with some, some person, I'm getting paid by them directly. I'm not getting paid by one or more third party individuals um, that have really no apparent connection to the transaction at hand. Um, you could potentially look for suspicious jurisdictions, you know, where the money is coming from. It's hard because, you know, you're receiving the wire, you, you as 
the recipient, let's say we're talking about a wire or bank transfer, you're not always getting to see that whole picture that like the financial institution does. Um, so just having a policy of, you know, I'm going to only accept money or a payment from, from you, from the individual I'm doing business with. Um, or, you know, let's say maybe you have funding from another financial institution, you have trade finance involved, but, um, you know, having better systems or, or, or you know, protocols in place that, you know, if it, something kind of has a, smells a little off, you know, we, we pause and, and think about it that for a second. And there, there's a certain program, it's called CTPAT. Um, it's used to, it's kind of focused on, um, more counterterrorism. I'm completely forgetting what it stands for right now. I apologize, okay. but it's something that Customs and Border Protection has instituted to help U.S. private businesses expedite their trade transactions um, in terms of, of imports, um, but they have to, in order to be able to do so, conduct, you know, create and, and maintain a, um, you know, systems and protocols to prevent misuse. And so they do have, they've, they've instituted certain uh, requirements for having training on trade-based money laundering. Um, so there's other safeguards that these, these companies need to have in place. I mean, kind of think of it as like a TSA pre-check or, you know, a global entry in terms of these, these, these businesses have undergone some training. They've undergone, you know, background checks to make sure that they're legitimate and in return, they get some expedited service. So could you institute something like that similarly to better educate on potentially being abused for other money laundering uh, purposes? Well, Jenna, you've helped us unpack a very complex uh, set of challenges. Uh, and I, I thank you for doing it in a language that an average person can actually kind of understand. Hopefully we've gotten some ideas about how we work together to deal with this. I mean, the challenge is vast. You know, just think of just the human side of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you talk about even just Chinese language, there's multiple dialects. And for generations, people have been using the dialects to be able to verify, is someone really from the place that they are? So even if we got people fluent in Chinese and they could read what's on WeChat, there's all kinds of other ways that someone could get exposed for being suspect when you enter into this dangerous world of multiple billions, if not trillions of dollars moving around undetected. Uh, so it's a fascinating subject area uh, and just want to express great thanks to you for jumping in on it. Now for the audience, if they want to follow your work and uh, anything that you might have to say about what's in the news, where's a website and maybe some social accounts people can go to to track your thoughts and your work? Sure. So um, you can find GFI at uh, www.gfintegrity.org. Um, we're on Twitter at at illicit flows, um, I'm at C Mavrelis, um, and you know we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn. Um, we produce a lot of research, a lot of advocacy. Um, so you know, I, I know we're focused here on China, but we do a lot of work, like I said, in Latin America. We look at extortion, we look at real estate money laundering, money laundering through private investment vehicles. We look at Africa, um, we look at environmental crimes, kind of a whole host of things. Um, so. You know, with China being kind of everywhere these days, um, both in terms of government presence with kind of, you know, the economic, um, you know, contributions and, and, you know, greater political presence, as well as the Chinese diaspora, um, it can be really relevant to, um, you know, no matter what region you're, you're focused on. Well, we certainly encourage people to jump in and learn more about the organization and your work. Uh, for audience, if you have enjoyed today's China Desk conversation, please tell your friends and consider subscribing on YouTube or on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you for joining and a special thank you to Channing for sharing her perspective. Until next time, I'm Steve Yates, your host here at the China Desk. Thank you for listening to the China Desk podcast, presented by the Federal Newswire and hosted by Steve Yates. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream.